a warm and hearty welcome to you ladies and gentlemen. We are live at the prestigious hotel, Sheraton Hotel in Kampala. For those of you tuned in on Zoom, um, on NTV, you're very welcome. We are at the launch of the Cooperative Resilience Research Report and the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index. And this is proudly brought to you by the Huru Institute for Social Development and Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. My name is Doris Mvano Ndizeye, and I'm a business analyst consultant at the Uhuru Institute for Social Development. And you're very welcome. Joining me as co-host, I'm going to be your host for today. Joining me as a co-host is a gentleman seated who is going to be working with me. He will come up later, but is Bishop Edmund Chizito. A little bit about me, I'm a wife, a mother, I'm passionate about personal development and economic development, and that's the reason that we're here. But before we go into uh, too much right now, I'm going to ask us to stand up and we sing the national anthem. We'll start with the Ugandan national anthem, and then we'll go to the East African anthem.
Thank you very much. Kindly have your seats. If you've just joined in, again, you're welcome. We are live at Sheraton Hotel in Kampala. Welcome to everyone who's tuned in from across the continent, within the region, and in the nations beyond. A very warm welcome to you. Again, we're at the launch of the Cooperative Resilience Research Report and the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index. We are living in very unprecedented times. We're coming at the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are now talks of wars, the Ukraine-Russia war. And the topic of resilience cannot come at a better time. It cannot be more timely. So the team is going to break down for us resilience. Are we resilient? Is Uganda resilient? We've just learned that there's a crisis meeting that is happening in various African uh, countries because donors are pulling out funds to African countries. Is Uganda resilient? Is Kenya resilient, our partners? Are you resilient as an individual? Are you resilient as a business, as a, as a cooperator, as a farmer in a district and tuning in right now on your TV screen? Are you resilient? Are you able to withstand the shocks and stresses that come with major changes in our environment, in our climate, in politics? Are we resilient? I will allow the team later on to dig, um, to dig into this topic in deep detail. So keep uh, seated tight and let's listen into the researchers. But before that, I would like to invite a very influential gentleman in the cooperative movement, passionate about generating wealth together as Ugandans. The gentleman I'm about to call is the Chief Executive Officer at the Uhuru Institute for Social Development. He's going to give us um, some welcome remarks to kickstart this uh, event today. So please join me in welcoming the Chief Executive Officer of the Uhuru Institute for Social Development, Mr. Leonard Okello. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> my apologies, my voice is not very good. I, I walked around town yesterday doing a meeting, a number of people were going to come for this meeting, and then by the time I got to lunchtime, I couldn't speak, so you have been lucky to hear my voice this morning because by one o'clock I couldn't speak yesterday. But that's for another day's discussion. Thank you very, very much, each and every one of you, for taking time of your very busy schedules and even traveling for some of you long distance as far away as Kavali, as far away as uh, Masindi and Eastern Uganda and coming to attend this meeting here today. We do not take that for granted because we know you have a lot of work to do to survive in the first place, even before you become resilient. And because of that, every agreement to come and join us in this discussion, we take it very seriously. I want to thank I want to thank everybody who has come. And before I can go ahead and uh, make the comments I'm going to make, I would like to proudly invite none other than Canon Grace Kaiso, our uh, board member and expertise with expertise in partnerships, but also a religious leader in Uganda to come and lead us in a word of prayers to hand us over into the wisdom of the Lord before we can go ahead. Thank you very much.
Let us pray. Gracious God, our creator and sustainer, we honor you and give you thanks for the gift of life, for the gift of each other, and for the reason for which we gather here this morning. We thank you that you are the source of wisdom and you have given us the thirst for knowledge which has given birth to the reason for which we gather here. So we commit our time into your hands that this will be a time of learning and appreciating how we can use our gifts to serve the common good. We ask this in the name of the living God. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Grace Kaiser, for, for the prayers. Fellow cooperators, in 2013, the Uhuru Institute was registered in this country with one simple mission to work with fellow Ugandans and Africans across the continent to, to, so that we together we can generate wealth. Our mission is to inspire each and every one of us in Africa, particularly in this country, Uganda, to generate wealth together. We look, it was a dream we had, and we asked ourselves, what kind of institution or infrastructure can be best used to generate wealth together, not single alone, to generate wealth together. I'm going to speak. Sorry. How do we generate wealth together? And we, uh, we got convinced after reading a number of documents that the best institution for us to generate wealth together and build our capacity for self-reliance, self-help, and working well together so that all of us get value. Not only a few of us getting value, all of us get value would be the cooperative movement. And so we started this journey in 2013. Together with the Uganda Cooperative Alliance, we went around this country training an average of 100 local leaders. They included religious leaders, cultural leaders, local government officials, district commercial officers, cooperative leaders, youth and women leaders. And in going around the country, we left them also each with copies of the law of cooperatives, the regulations, and we also left them with a training manual, <clears throat> which we had developed. After going, and I mean all around the country, that all the ethnodemographic subregions of the countries that were Karamoja, Teso, Acholi, Lango, West Nile, Bunyoro, Prenzori, Kigezi, Ankole, West Buganda, East Buganda, Busoga, Bukedi, Bugisu. We went all this around this country. And when we met people, the level of excitement about cooperatives was unprecedented. Everybody wanted it back like yesterday. It had just gone to confirm a report we had just come released in 2013, um, early 2013, in which 98% of the people we met, 98% of the people we met wanted cooperatives back and active in Uganda as like yesterday. And that told us Ugandans were yearning to get vibrant cooperatives once more. But when we came back to Kampala, and started assessing how the impact of our training, one thing came out very clear. When in 2016 we went to visit the Department of Cooperatives and met a registrar of cooperatives, Mr. Joseph Kitandwe then, he said, now I understand. We have seen a rise in the, the 
registration of cooperatives, and every time we ask them, they say they were trained by the Uhuru Institute. Now we understand where this is coming from. That's a good piece of work, but let's keep in touch and work together. But one thing struck, struck us, a number of people started calling us, when are you coming to do the next training? We realized there is still work to be done to get us more self-reliant, more self-help, more self-responsibility. And because of that, we continue to do some research. We released the research in 2018, which provoked thinking about the status of cooperatives in Uganda. What's their status? And then now, this study which we are launching today, the Cooperative Resilience Research Report, out of which we shall launch the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index. We have done so because all the evidence we are gathering from the countryside shows that there is a need for us to start measuring clearly what impact the cooperatives are actually having in the country and what we need to do more to do better as a, as, as a cooperative movement as a, as a country. We will also be unveiling to you a software called the COP Profiler, which will be the tool we shall do, use to do these measurements. I'll not go into the details of all these things, but because I'm not expert enough to discuss them in that detail. But I'd like to thank each and every one of you and recognize the following. Online, the International Cooperative Alliance has connected cooperatives on their monthly bulletin, and so there are people going to join in different parts of Africa and beyond online to attend this online. I already received quite a number of confirmations to me, to my WhatsApp, confirming that they are, they are going online, so we should let them in. I would like to particularly recognize and thank the Africa Institute of, uh, the Africa Cooperative Institute of South Africa, with whom we're in a discussion and hope to build a broader relationship to support the cooperative movement across the continent. They are already online with a number of researchers who recently conducted a very, uh, very interesting conference on cooperatives and uh, we are in discussion with them. They are already here. We are welcome, uh, the people of South Africa and beyond. I just want to say, Amandla, Amandla, thank you very much. For the Pan-Africanists across out there, I know you are watching and I know you mean well and you want to get something better out of the cooperative movement for the continent. With what is happening in the world out there now, we can no longer sit and wait for freebies. Because if you listen and be following what has been happening recently, Oxfam International, the Red Cross, already commented that money which was supposed to support refugees and displaced peoples in the African continent and other parts of the world has been cut, in some cases as, as, as high as 70%, to support the refugee crisis in Europe. They are not doing because they are such terrible people. They also now have a problem at home. That means time has come for us to sit up and take responsibility about our problems at home in Uganda and in the African continent. And this discussion today is about us taking that responsibility. And I call upon you not to listen to the research only because it is an academic document. Please listen to this research today with a question lingering what shall we do after this research has come out? What shall we do to become self-reliant and do self-help as the African peoples? I thank you very much and wish you all a great morning. I am, I would be so rude to myself and to the World Institute if I did not pick the wisdom of one of the solid cooperators in this city who is none other than the chair of the board of the Uru Institute for Social Development. Many of us who know him very well, closely, we know him as Uncle D. Uncle D. Uncle D is dance, uh, engineer Dansan Kisule, the chair and the CEO of YSEV, Multipurpose Cooperative Society, a society founded by Christians, mainly in and around Watoto Church. And we would like to invite Dansan, please, to come and share with us your wisdom of cooperatives and what this means, this study means for the cooperative movement.
to welcome them. Uh, thank you, Leonard. I am going to be brief. Uh, so in order to be brief, the best thing is you write your speech. Because then there you are guided to keep within the confines of your speech other than speaking out of your head like Leonard was doing. Just a small correction. I'm not the chair, I'm actually the CEO. I was the chair uh, and then my, my, my term limits ended. Now, of course, in the cooperatives there, you can be as chairman as long as people still want you. But then there were term limits. But let me keep to my script in the interest of time. But also you've come to listen to the research report and not speeches from people. <clears throat> so fellow cooperators and all participants, all protocol observed. I bring you greetings from our wonderful Uhuru Institute, think tank, one of the many innovations at the Institute built to serve the cooperative movement in Uganda and beyond, like Leonard has explained. Today, you are going to witness the launch of our third strategic research intended to inform the decisions that will make our cooperatives sustainable and resilient. This is because just like many co cooperatives are registered, many are equally collapsing every day in Uganda, like you all know. At least I belong to a cooperative which has been in existence for the last 22 years. And I can proudly say that and we thank God for that. But I also know there are many that have collapsed in between that time. Most of these collapsing cooperatives are a result of the wrong mindset of the members who only form them to attract external money from NGOs, donors, politicians, and especially the government of Uganda. Money for eating and not for use to develop their cooperatives and themselves. You know what I am talking about. This research is one in a series of many others, all, all of them already completed, and you yet to come that address the mindset of Ugandans towards building a truly purpose-driven cooperative movement and people-centered socioeconomic transformation of our beloved country. Fellow, cooperator, fellow cooperators, I urge all of you and especially the government of Uganda, the Minister of Trade, Industry, and Cooperatives, to take the findings of this study very serious in guiding the wealth creation agenda of our beloved country. We cannot just be pumping money at poverty with the people who are not going to mentally change their lives and be better. We must address mindset change as our top priority if these thousands of cooperatives should create wealth in this country. Let me repeat that as I end. We must address mindset change as our top priority. If these thousands of cooperatives that we have in Uganda should create wealth for our country. I say all this for God and our country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was Dunstan Kisule, TUI board chairman, and before him was Leonard Okello, the CEO of TUI, the Uhuru Institute for Social Development. Very wise words there. And I quote, he said, we must address mindset change 
in order to, to create wealth for Ugandans, and I would add, for generations. Leonard Okello was passionate about Pan-Africanism, and I think generally we need to be concerned about Ubuntu. Um, let's care for each other, let's work together, let's build each other up as Ugandans, as Africans, as world citizens, if I may add. Thank you so much. The next speaker I'm going to invite is and has been our partner for a good amount of time now. Our friends, our sisters um, across the border, and that is Busara Center for Behavioral Economics from Nairobi, even though they are in other countries as well. I would like to welcome Gideon Tor. He is the engagement director at Busara Center. Please welcome with me Gideon Tor. Thank you, Doris. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gideon Tor. I'm an engagement director at the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. We are a research and advisory organization um, based in Nairobi, but we also have an office here in Kampala, in Dar es Salaam, Lagos, and Delhi. And what we do is we partner with organizations such as uh, Uhuru to conduct research in various forms, all targeted at um, economic development. We are very proud to be associated with the Uhuru Institute. We've been friends, we've been partners for the last seven years, and we've seen a lot of transformation happen both within the Uhuru Institute itself, but also in the broader region um, and in the broader cooperative uh, space. My colleagues who, who are joining me today will be able to speak a bit more about the work that we've done, uh, particularly the launch of this re uh, research report. But I wanted to say one or two things um, to put this into, the con into context. So I think we're all aware that the world we're living in today is, uh, let's say a very different world from the last two years. And one of the things that, are, that we've all learned, whether it's personally or even professionally and in the world we live in, is that the operating environment that we are in today is a lot more volatile, it's a lot more complex, it's uncertain. Um, there are so many issues happening, whether it's COVID over the last two years, whether we have geopolitical crises, like what's happening right now in Europe, um, climate change, whether we're seeing disruptions in the technological space, whether it's positive or negative, all of these things affect us individually and also affect the work that we do, the businesses. And that also means that cooperatives face the same challenges. Um, and this research report will provide some insights into how cooperatives, very much like individuals, can start to have a mind shift, um, a shift in mindset uh, to be able to adapt better to the world that we live in today, the very uncertain world. And you know, in order for cooperatives to be sustainable and to have continuity, they have to think about adaptability, they have to think about resilience, they, are, they have to think about innovation, all of those things come in together. And so we're very, we're very proud of the whole Institute, Jane Leonard and your whole team we're very proud because um, for two things uh, I'd like to highlight today. One is you are walking the talk. You know, we've been friends and we've had very honest conversations and we all know that the COVID period was very difficult for Uhuru as, a, as an institute, but we were able to demonstrate resilience and walk the talk. Uh, and secondly, and I think more relevant for today's conversation, we are proud because of the thought leadership you're providing in the cooperative movement. You are generating knowledge, you're generating uh, guidance, insights in a way that is very contextually relevant to different types of cooperatives, big or small, in the agribusiness sector and beyond. Um, and beyond Uganda, the same challenges that cooperatives face here are the ones that are faced in Kenya, uh, Tanzania and beyond. So we, we're very proud and we look forward to the conversation that we're going to have today. 
uh, keep on inspiring the cooperative movement, keep on challenging our thinking, and keep on walking the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Gideon Toh, the Engagement Director at Gusara Center for Behavioral Economics. Thank you for those uh, touching words to Uhuru. We are equally proud to be partners with Gusara over time and, and we'll continue with this partnership for a long time. Okay, um, the, next, uh, the next on the agenda is we're going to dig into the reason wh that we're here. I hope everyone is as excited as I am. Uh, we're going to go into the presentation. Um, I will let my co-host be the one to take us through this session, and that is Bishop Edmund Chizito. Um, before that, I would like to recognize the presence of the MP, Dr. Biakatonda Abdallah, um, who would like to just greet us briefly because he, he, he needs to go into another, he's called into another meeting. So if you can just greet us and then we'll have um, Bishop Edmund Chizito to take us through the presentation um, of the report. Thank you. Dr. Bekotonda, you're very welcome. Uh, the CEO of the Institute for Social Development, the partners, all participants. I'm sorry I have uh, a number of engagements and uh, suffice to mention I would like, just like to make a, a remark or two. But first of all, I'd like to appreciate the World Institute for Social Development for this very important uh, milestone. I must say I was one of the respondents when they were doing this research. That was during the lockdown. I think it was a Zoom meeting, and I did not have an opportunity to meet you. I thank you so much for the endeavor. Uh, as I first mentioned, I think uh, cooperative is one of the key drivers of any economy. And us in the Workers' Fraternity, under ILO, ILO Recommendation 193, basically enshrines cooperative as one of the key drivers of development. And then the ILO Convention 127. These are very key. And I think uh, what we need to do is basically to use this research, and we are happy we have this research. The report is going to be launched today to ensure that at least one, we identify the gaps, the Lego infrastructure which is present. What are these gaps that we need to do? And as a parliament, we shall be proud to see that uh, these gaps are identified and we take them as over legislation into the house so that we have a better package of the laws that can actually help propel the cooperative movement in Uganda and the region as a whole. The other one is that uh, we are focusing on one of the desired outputs. And of course, uh, in my expectation, I'm looking at how this research can you speak to NDP3? NDP3. What are the key silent issues that we need to address as a matter of urgency? The other thing is uh, how it will speak to the principles of state policy in our constitution and the number of articles they are in. Then you remember quite very well aware that uh, Uganda is one of the signatories to the Sustainable Development Goals. How does this speak to that? And in the case of any gaps, can we fill them and ensure that at least they address adequately. The other one is, um, we would like to say that at least this research is utilized fully, because we realize that as a government, we, are, we have moved towards the parish development model, a number of other programs. And of course, the cooperative is one of the vehicles that we are using as to implement the parish development model, right from the village. So it's important to actually highlight all those key issues, and I think this research is going to help us a lot. The other one, we, we find that countries the 14 countries, you look at, I think, Jordan, you look at Finland, they have all looked at these parameters. And uh, the key issue here is that how does the cooperative movement now contribute to our GDP in terms of percentage? Then we could also have other index, like uh, 
the performance measurement index, the structure adjustment, I mean measurement index, so that we can also highlight on the key issues. I would have probably liked to stay to the end, but I think because of other pressing issues, I want to wish World Show Institute for Development and the participants nice deliberations, and I know we shall share the report. I thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Biakatonda. Can we give him another round of applause? Thank you all for coming and for being so attentive. We're moving into our next session where we'll have the actual meat served, uh, the presentation of the uh, report. Now, this is a serious report. Cooperatives, cities are built on conglomeration. When people leave their countryside uh, residences to come together, they're able to build cities. They create energy. They create thinking processes, they create markets. So coming together is a powerful force of positive change, progress and advancement. Now cooperatives bring like-minded people together and as we will hear later, uh, cooperatives are not only for agriculture, they're not only for farming. We know about cooperatives in the areas of finance, of housing, health, uh, some of them we know about them without knowing that they're actually cooperatives, burial groups in the rural countryside. So this is a very important dynamic, bringing people together, like-minded people together. And Uhuru is not an ordinary NGO. They empower social businesses. Some, some people, some of us come from the background of business. We look for money for ourselves and our shareholders. Uhuru Institute does not look for money for themselves. They look for money for other people. Can we give them a round of applause? That really touches me. If I were in their shoes, I'd be looking for money for myself and my company shareholders, but they're not doing that. They're not only, they're also not even, only giving out handouts. They're empowering the masses. The traditional land government organization gives out handouts. They create a borehole for you and they go away. You might not know how to sustain it, but Huru Institute builds that in. I'm trying to create a background for us to understand this topic very well, better. Now, this report, trying to understand the resilience of these cooperatives, yes, you can create them, but supposing there's a shock. Right now, we're going through a time of shock. We had the shock, the two-year shock of the, uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we have the global disruption from the Ukraine-Russia crisis. So when such a thing happens, are you resilient enough to withstand it and be able to continue because a better day is going to come. So the, this report, this survey, and it took one and a half years to undertake. We're going to hear from the lead investigator. It's a 164 page report. Uh, they surveyed over 100 cooperatives. Honorable Biakatonda says he was one of the people who was reached out to. 100 cooperative leaders. Uh, there were focus group discussions with up to 128 cooperative members. And uh, there were several other more than 30 inter uh, information interviews. It covered more than 63 districts of the country. So it's a report that we need to take rather seriously. Now, the next session is going to be, we're going to hear the report being presented. Then we'll have um, discussions from other people who took part in this report. I would like right now to invite the lead investigator, the panel, to come to the front. Ms. Jane Amugoyokelo, I'll ask you to step forward to take your seat at the high table. There's no table at the podium. I would also like to have uh, to invite Mr. James Kenga, the co investigator, to step forward as well. Mr. Samuel Otim uh, from the Trail Analyt uh, Analytics. Dr. Fred Mohumza is supposed to be with us. He's unable to come uh, because he's been invited for a national duty. Now, I'd also like to invite Mr. Leonard Akello to step forward to join this team, and Mr. Dunstan Chisulde as well. Then we'll be ready to start uh, with the main presentation. I would urge you to pay close attention because that's why we're all here. The report is titled, Upholding Cooperative Identity as a Crucial Determinant of Cooperative Resilience, a case study of cooperatives in Uganda. We have people listening in from around the world, we have people in South Africa joining via Zoom and other parts of the world. I will not take any more time. I'll invite you, Jane Amugeokelo, 
the principal investigator and operations director at Uhuru Institute to come and present your report. Jane Amogeo Okello, you're welcome. Good morning, everyone. We are very excited to have you here today, and uh, it feels like a new marriage. And yet, it's been a journey that we've been walking all these years. I love to meet our cooperative partners. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Ngora, Kabale. Can our co cooperatives rise up for recognition? That's the reason why we are here today. Thank you. Um, all protocol observed. Um, this morning, we'll be presenting to you our research report. As Edman already said, the research is titled Upholding Cooperative. Sorry about that. Um, our research is titled Upholding Cooperative Identity as a Crucial Determinant of Cooperative Resilience. Now, there are very fundamental words in that. One is identity. The other is crucial. Because, you know, there are so many things that happen, but crucial determinant of cooperative resilience. This research was done in Uganda, as um, you will be seeing, and um, along the way, we learned so many things as well. Uh, we will be looking at our methodology this morning. We'll also present to you the conceptual framework that guided this research, and we'll also be taking you through the analytical framework and that is where you will meet the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index. And finally, we'll be taking you through the findings of the research. It's a multifaceted research that uh, we undertook. That's why, you know, there is resilience, there is identity, and all this that is happening. But I, when we just started uh, the conversation about this research, I remember when we met as, as a team, we said, what direction is this going to take? So it was interesting to see ourselves uh, get to this point. Before I go deep into the research, I would like to thank the Open Society Foundation, London, for financing this research together with our partners, uh, Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. In a special way, we also want to thank the government of Uganda, particularly the President's Office, uh, the National Council for Science and Technology, that gave us approval to go ahead with the research. Makere Social Sciences Research Ethics Committee that approved this research as important. Thank you very much. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, our mother ministry, Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, where we met a lot of the extension officers and the agriculture officers at the district. We also interacted with officials from the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, because financial cooperatives are now regulated as well under Ministry of Finance. We also worked very closely with the Ministry of Local Government, where we met the district commercial officers, the cows, and the production officers. The RDCs, the res resident district commissioners, very supportive. We did this research amidst COVID and they were there to give us um, way and guidance. I also want to thank the cooperative colleges, especially Ndeja University, where we have Dr. Bouvule, uh, who supported this research. At the same time, uh, we also want to thank T T Tororo Cooperative College, that was very much uh, at the center of this research as well. To the research team that are here and online, Thank you for uh, bracing COVID to be able to get the data for us to get this report. 
and to the cooperative leaders who are in the house, online, and wherever you are, thank you for receiving us and giving us all that you could. And finally, to the board and management of the Uhuru Institute and the staff of Uhuru and Busara, thank you for all the dedication that you put in for this research. Um, when we walked in, I could feel the cooperative spirit. But I'm not sure if it's only, it's only me who understands that spirit. Sometimes we, we relate to spirits only when we talk about Jesus or we talk about Jaja Mwanga. But in this house today, we have the cooperative spirit. And that is, that is very much the, the discussion we're going to have around cooperative identity. When Gideon made his speech, he mentioned that the world is at a place of volatility, of uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. If you look at the current um, war that is happening in Ukraine, only a few of us understand what's going on. Because one day, we just saw tanks drive in and saw bullets, you know? And we, here we are an African people, a people that are largely, in my language, we say, you know, we are, we are almost on the receiving end. Almost in every budget, there is a donor supporting something. So I had a, a border man saying, you know, this war in Ukraine could affect our oil. All they are seeing is the fuel because that's what they relate with. But how about you? As we discuss resilience and identity, let's look at this not just from the cooperative industry segment, but holistically as a country. Cooperatives are positioned to drive this country to a direction that we all want to be. Now, I have been told severally that cooperatives are resilient naturally. You've had conversations where people say, you know, women are very strong, women are resilient. Who has heard that? So it's, it's, it's almost the same thing that cooperatives have been baptized to be. Very strong, very resilient, and very sustainable. But the question I'd want to pose to you as we go into the discussion is, if you belong to a cooperative, is it really resilient? Do we even understand what resilience means? Is it sustainable? Sometimes we have talked about resilience and we have confused it with sustainability. And this morning as we discuss, we realize that those are two very different things but connected and each of them borders onto supporting the other. Now, in Uganda, we have been disrupted as cooperatives by the war for those of you that uh, belong to the cooperative unions, we know that our cooperative unions lost a lot of money and assets during the different wars. That is the Luero Triangle War. We also had cooperatives lose a lot in the north with the NRA war and all these insurgencies. And this morning I was on the morning show and the, guest, um, the, the host was asking, what killed our cooperatives? Part of it is the war. But today we are confronted with COVID, uh, locusts, all sorts of diseases, including cancer, which is not discussed very regularly, you know? Or if it's discussed, it's discussed like a high level disease. It's not brought out as something that is affecting all of us. We are also in a situation where we have natural disasters. Just recently, we had a volcano erupt in Congo. And you can imagine what happened to the communities that were around this mountain. We also have a lot of income inequalities. I, I proudly tell people that I, I had my two parents. My father was um, a wealthy businessman, but my mother was a peasant. So when you look at the, the peasant and the wealthy businessman, you realize that the world is in two different places. Every day, a peasant has a different story to tell from us who are in our offices, 
who are in our SEs because their challenges are different. And most of our cooperatives actually belong to this group I'm calling peasants, who wake up wondering when the rain is going to fall. Can you imagine it's taken six months before rain has fallen in northern Uganda? Where I come from, which is Dokolo district, we have not seen rain for six months. Grass is gray, no rain. And today, as we discuss resilience, think about all these things happening around us. There is disruption, ICT disruption, both positive and negative. The positive thing about the ICT disruption is that we are able to communicate faster. But there is my mother who cannot even use a smartphone. It's scary. It's scary because perhaps she can't speak English, but the bank is now saying for you to transact and you belong to a cooperative, you need to use mobile banking. That's disruption. Are our cooperatives ready for this kind of disruption? We are looking at climate change, and I think I've mentioned this. Some of the policies we have around us as cooperatives are not policies that are growing us and we'll be seeing as uh, we discuss our findings. So I thought it was important for us to understand the context of where we are and why then this study is situated as very important for the cooperative movement. Um, I, I can see Honorable Gume in the house. Honorable, you're welcome. We recognize your presence. Um, and as I mentioned, Honorable Gume, I know that cooperatives are being registered every day in the ministry where you sit. As I speak, there are about 30,000 cooperatives in Uganda. So this morning when I was being told cooperatives are dead, I realized even the journalists don't know that we are here, Honorable. So we must tell a different story that we might be in a coma, for those that are in a coma, and then those of us whose hearts are beating actually are alive because the narrative is different. Everybody asks me, who killed cooperatives? Who was there when they were dying? I need a witness for this. <laughs> okay. So as cooperatives are being registered every day, others are collapsing, and that's the reality on the ground. If they're not collapsing, they're declining, and declining because of some of the discussion we'll be having on cooperative identity. That tells us that cooperatives have inherent risks. There are risks that are within what we are calling the cooperative identity and vulnerabilities, but that's not the reason for them to die. There are ways in which we can go about this, as our research will tell you. But then we also have external risks, some of which I have already mentioned as I started off. The cooperative movement, unfortunately, in Uganda continues to lament. Everybody wants someone to fix their problem. I don't know how many calls you get in a day, Honorable. Or oh, um, I also saw a commissioner, um, Robert Mpachivi. I'm sure your phone is always um, ringing from the cooperatives on the challenges they have, the lamentations. And today we'll be taking us to revelations and actions, the books, the books of acts as far as resilience is concerned. So in our research, we present the cooperatives as complex network of internal and external relationships. There's a lot of relationship within the cooperative, but also outside the cooperatives. But key to this research is the principal agency theory, which we'll also be discussing. I thought I should just throw that at us so that once the discussions uh, deepen, you'll then understand why these are very important. So this makes responsible character, personality, and culture central in delivering sustainable and resilient cooperatives. Now, I know that we all come from a tribe, either you're Muganda, or you're Lango, or you're Musoga, you're something. And we have all, we've all been called something. I don't know the stereotypes you have, but I guess those stereotypes come as a result of your culture. So in so doing, as we discuss cooperative identity this morning, we'll get to understand that cooperatives have their own culture. They have their values, they have their principles, and they have a way in which they are defined. 
Now, as we also look at this, in Uganda, there is very limited focus on aligning the personalities and the character of the people running our cooperatives to the cooperative identity, which we are going to discuss. Yet, more interest and evidence proves that the importance of cooperatives is very important, is, is very crucial. And therefore, the people that are in the cooperatives must be people that hold value systems that can drive these cooperatives to the next level. We're excited that uh, cooperatives, when, once NDP3 was um, finalized and now the parish development model, cooperatives were cited as the engine. But whether government understood what a cooperative is, is another subject we'll discover if we are all speaking the same language. Now, this research also today is going to unveil a resilience measurement index, which points out to the fact that our country is bleeding as far as record keeping is concerned. Record keeping, measurement, reporting, we are not doing very well as far as that is concerned. But our efforts should be able to nurture that. Before I go ahead, I want to start with something simple, which is really what cooperatives are. Everybody thinks, in Uganda particularly, that circles are a different animal altogether. You find someone saying, me, I belong to a circle, I don't belong to a cooperative. I've even had an MP when, they were say, when we were talking about a circle, they thought it was this round thing that we, you know, we used to draw. It is, that is the level of distortion we have in as far as understanding what cooperatives are. So as we discuss our identity, cooperatives are autonomous associations of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations. So we are not about profit. I hear people saying, ah, me, my cooperative is not paying me a profit. It's about service. As you're in a cooperative, are you delivering service? And this is done through a jointly owned and democratically run enterprise. We are member owned, member controlled, member utilized and uh, value based cooperatives. Now, we introduced in our research something called real and organic cooperatives. Because we realized that there are some genetically modified ones and I would want to throw more light on these GM, GM cooperatives. I hope the Mioga ones don't fall in the category of the GMs. Don't quote me. Cooperatives run according to the cooperative identity. The, that's the organic ones. But then there are the pseudo ones. The ones that the, the donor has told you to form. The one that also government has told you to form. Because a cooperative is autonomous and voluntary. So when you put us together and say, to access this money, form a cooperative, there's a problem. The culture gets distorted from the word go on who has influenced the decision for cooperative formation. The International Cooperative Alliance defines the statement on cooperative identity, therefore, as the shared understanding, shared understanding and identification of cooperatives, core principles, values, and the vision amongst its members contributing to individual members' productive degree of commitment, self-sacrifice, I want to repeat, commitment, self-sacrifice to reach the cooperative's business and social cultural goals. We will realize that as we discovered resilience, some cooperatives are stuck. They're at a point of rigidity, no movement. There's entrenchment, as we'll be seeing, from our research findings. So cooperatives, as part of the cooperative identity, we have the definition where we have just come from, and then also we have the traditional cooperative values. These are very central for our research. The key values that we'll be discussing and the findings will show are self-responsibility, self-help, democracy, 
equality, equity, and solidarity. I won't go to the details because in our findings we'll be able to have this. But there's one that, uh, a few that I want to highlight in here, self-responsibility. If somebody tells you to form a cooperative and you're forming it because of money, you're not being self-responsible. And for that reason, you're not going to help yourself. You're going to start saying, when is the money coming? You will agree with me that the, some Mioga circles did, uh, di had a still bath. Why? The moment money refused to come, they said, but you told us money was coming. So self-help was derailed at that point. Quickly, we'll also look at the ethical values of cooperatives, which again is very central. Here we have honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. Very, very key to our research findings. As a country, we are bleeding with dishonest people. We are dishonest at a personal level. Even at the point of joining the cooperative, we do not state the reason why we are joining these cooperatives. Then when we are in the cooperative, we are dishonest about how many bank accounts we have, dishonest about how many wives we have. By the way, it's important to declare the number of wives in the cooperative because when you die, we need to pay whatever it is. Or we want your wives to join the cooperatives as well because it's a family unit. We are dishonest about bank account details in the sense that you have borrowed from cooperative Jen, you've borrowed from cooperative uh, Gideon, you've borrowed from cooperative. You see the dishonesty. We'll be looking at that. The other thing that is very, very important in these ethical values is social responsibility. Is your cooperative destroying the environment? Is your cooperative feeding the world on pesticides? Some of us are so money hungry, we are going to spray tomatoes even when they're not ripe to ripen. And then we complain of cancer. And some of our cooperatives are at the center of this. And our values are saying, be social responsible. Caring for others. What interest rate are you charging your members? Some cooperatives are charging as high as 5% per month. Do you know what that means to the rural farmer? 60% per annum. Caring for others means that a cooperative, at least at the maximum, should be charging 12% per annum. Why? It's members' money. It's service. It's not profit. So this is how these values play in. And finally, on the cooperative identity, we'll be looking at the principles. Now, the, our forefathers understood that as human beings, we are very dynamic. We are very different in the way we do things. So the, in the wisdom of the Rochdale pioneers, they realized the need to coin the principles to guide the way we behave because they realized from the Industrial Revolution that left to the, 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 the apparatus of private sector that you will not find the human face of business. So the cooperative principles were coined, and we'll see that. So the other word that is very important before we go to the, the, the conceptual framework is resilience. Resilience comes from the Latin word resilia, jumping back, the ability to recover, and, and a, a lot of it, though, has been used in the context of ecology and physics. You hear people saying, is this rope resilient? But even us as organizations, are you resilient? And we'll be seeing that from the cooperative context. Then there is sustainability. When we went out for this research, we had conceived resilience as something that envelops sustainability. But along the way, we realized that certain elements of resilience can actually have a negative uh, might have negative connotations as far as sustainable development is concerned. And you see that in our findings that we found that certain cooperatives were actually resilient. Their leaders had been in the chair for like 30 years. They are the same people, the same manager, same everybody. Everyone else is suffering except them. So there's resilience. But is there sustainability? 
there wasn't. So we, as we discuss our findings, resilience and sustainability becomes very key to us. The purpose of our research was to establish a framework that will guide the prediction, identification, measurement, and reporting of risks, vulnerability, capabilities, adaptability, and innovative strategies and actions for resilience of cooperatives. I know there's so much jargon here, but there's no other way we can you know, present this. I hope that with time we can be able to have it uh, easy on us. One of the objectives of the research was to identify how cooperatives have used their uniqueness, the kind of uniqueness I've just been describing, uh, enshrined in their definition and values to cope remain stable and adapt to situations, innovate and remain resilient in the face of adversity. The other objective was to establish how adherence or non-adherence to the definitions, principles and values of cooperatives in Uganda have increased their risks and vulnerabilities and contributed to their instability, limited adaptation, innovation and the overall lack of resilience. And finally, the other objective was to influence, to, to study the influence of other factors on cooperative resilience. Because we might be thinking internally, you know, we, we are self-contained, but there are other factors affecting the resilience of cooperatives. Our methodology was um, dynamic. This is a formative study that deployed both the quantitative and qualitative methods. We had 100 surveys with cooperatives and then 34 key informant interviews and uh, that already talked about the people that represented, and we had 16 focus group discussions with 128 cooperative members and leaders. Uh, the majority of the cooperatives that participated in the surveys were primary cooperatives and um, cooperatives at different levels. The primary cooperatives have membership that are individuals, then the secondary cooperatives have membership that are the primary cooperatives, then there are the tertiary cooperatives that have primary and secondary, and then the apex cooperatives. So for us, we reached out to 66 uh, primary cooperatives, and then 31 area cooperative enterprises, and then three tertiary cooperatives. We also were very cognizant of the uh, complex ethnodemographic uh, distribution of Uganda. So we reached out to all the regions uh, to ensure that we don't miss out on any cultural biases uh, to the research. We went to 63 districts. I won't read them, but uh, we went to all the regions. Um, so in our methodology, we provide evidence of how resilience measurement index can be applied in a forward perspective to predict and identify risks and vulnerabilities that the cooperatives might be exposed to, but also in a backward, uh, backward perspective to understand the fault modes mirrored through the resilience quadrants, because you realize that there are certain historical factors that have led to certain cooperatives being where they are. The results show a triple effect, uh, reverse cause and effect relationship within the cooperative identity, characteristics, environmental factors, and the cooperative resilience indicators. Uh, in terms of sector, we had cooperatives in the mining representing 1%, housing 1%, energy 2, transport 8, multipurpose cooperatives 22, uh, financial cooperatives at 23, and then the agricultural cooperatives at 43. Um, in terms of region, we had more cooperatives come from eastern Uganda, uh, western had 23, central 21, northern 14, west Nile 6, and Karamoja 2. So you know we were looking for cooperatives in Karamoja. When the researchers went, we were told there were cooperatives, only for us to realize there were village savings and loan associations. But we finally got some two cooperatives and we worked with. So honorable, there is a message for you there. There's a part of the country where we shall be looking for cooperatives. I hope now they are there. Um, we take the organization systems resilience approach with a view that cooperatives by nature 
have a culture, an identity, and I think I've already mentioned this. And this culture defines the way they function and the way they relate with the broader pastel. That's a political, economic, and social, eco, social, social economic ecosystem. We view resilience as intrinsic and an intrinsic attribute of the cooperative organization, nurtured and fostered by the understanding and application of our identity. The identity is exploited and deployed as a defense and adaptation mechanism to internal and external disturbances. And I want to simplify that, that the way in which we do our democracy is different from the way a company does democracy or in the way in which they run their, their corporate governance is slightly different. And one of the very significant differences for a cooperative is one member, one vote. That even if I have a thousand shares, in my cooperative, I still have one vote. And yet for the company, if I have a thousand shares and another has two, I with a thousand shares takes more superiority over the one with two shares. So you th start seeing that cooperative identity is very unique. The study presents resilience as having a duality of systems capacity to adapt to internal and external disruptions and adversity by changing its structure, that we are not static. Within the identity, we can actually modify and adapt certain things. But you'll go to a cooperative and someone will tell you, for us, we have to meet under that mango tree. That's where we met in 1962, and that is it. So we have this old mentality that we must meet physically, and I think some of the cooperatives here that worked with us in the COVID period will testify that once we moved our meetings to Zoom, people were asking, are you hearing us? Why? Because things like Zoom, online engagements are very new to our cooperatives, and yet it can actually be adapted. We graphically advanced that cooperatives adhere to the traditional and ethical values along with their universal principles to resist and adapt. Um, I'm going to take you very fast to the framework itself where we, we actually draw all the conceptual framework as I, um, I step down for Kenga to come in. Um, so we look at the cooperative traditional and ethical values along with the principles as independent variables. That once we have the principles and values of cooperatives, which I have already explained, these are deployed in, in the cooperative through processes and systems like the AGM meetings and all this that you know happen in the cooperative. Those then become the intervening variables that when a cooperative has a strategic plan, organizes meetings, Yeah, so the, those are the intervening variables. Now, the intervening variables uh, interact with the external environment. That when a cooperative has its AGM, and the AGM is original, not the one that is influenced by the politician or somebody. Oh, by the way, for the politician, I don't have anything against you. But we realize that a lot of times we go to the cooperative AGMs and divert some of these meetings. So it is just to say that the space for the AGM should actually be the AGM. Um, so yes, the intervening variables, that's the AGMs, the structures, interact with some of what is happening in the external, that's the policies, all those influences, the technological change, and that then creates pressure within the cooperative. And that interaction can then cause this cooperative to give us indicators which can show whether it's resilient or not. So we, the resilient uh, indicators that we look at are things like collaboration, the market position of a cooperative, security, redundancy in terms of resource, robustness, agility, science and technology, risk management, and sustainability. I'll quickly run through that. Now, in our discussion about resilience, we thought it was important to also look at the, the two dimensions of resilience. There is what we call the magnitude dimension, where you're looking at how the values and the principles of cooperatives interact with the environment, what the systems internally, how does it actually interact with the environment. But also, away from the magnitude dimension, 
we then look at um, the system's desirability dimension, where now you're talking of the, the stakeholders. We have the human stakeholders, that's the employees, the board members, the members, the customers, all these are, um, are the people that actually define the system's desirability. But we realize that even if the systems are strong and the people themselves that create this network have a fault line. Let's say they are thieves or they are unserious. The cooperative will not be resilient as we look at. So those are the dimensions that we look at. Critical to the system's desirability, we look at the principal agent relationship. Cooperatives delegate a lot of responsibility. That the members are the supreme decision making organ delegating responsibility to the board. But these people that you're delegating responsibility to, do they have self-responsibility? Are they honest? Are they open? The people that you're electing, are they people that have self-drive? Do they want to take you somewhere? So that relationship is very key, as you'll see in the findings of our research. You realize that if you have a, an agent, like a board member or a manager who is a thief, who is manipulative, who is lazy, your cooperative is in a serious, serious challenge. But also, the members have to remember that they have control over the agents. Sometimes you've gone to the cooperative and the chairman is the alpha and the omega. If chairman has not come, nothing happens. And some managers have actually taken over the responsibility of the cooperative. They are strangling the cooperative that without this manager, there is no business at the cooperative. Look into your systems. You realize that the principal uh, agent um, theory is very functional in, in, in as far as resilience of our cooperatives is concerned. So therefore, resilience does not necessarily mean sustainability. Uh, because of limitations in time, I'll go quickly to the resilience indicators, which you must understand as we discuss uh, the measurement framework. Now, from the interactions of the values, the principles, and how they are being applied to the external environment, the results that we expect are these indicators. One, collaboration. The cooperative operations must jointly be planned and executed. How many times does a cooperative have a strategic plan? Do they even have them anyway? Are there business plans that guide these cooperatives? And therefore, if there is a business plan that was written by a consultant, is there collaboration? We, and I think we have some cooperatives in the house here that we've supported with their business and, and, and strategic plans. When we asked some of them how their, their strategies came up, they said, we hired a consultant. So what is in the strategy? The consultant knows. Market position represents financial capabilities, the volumes of the shares, the business turnover. How many cooperatives understand shares? I remember in a focus group discussion in Kabale, someone said to make a member buy a share is like making them pass through a needle. Can you imagine? That was a statement from a cooperator. For them to buy a share is like passing through the eye's needle. That is how complex they have envision shareholding, and yet you cannot have strong market position without shareholding and a high turnover. How many businesses actually have strong turnover? Are you making money? Or are you parading and calling yourself a cooperative? What are you cooperating in? I keep telling people when I go to the village that your drinking association is not a cooperative. It is a place for you to drink. A cooperative is a business. How much money did you make today? yesterday, tomorrow. Awareness and sens sensitivity. Are we able to comprehend vulnerability? Are we able to cite out some of the risks? Sometimes we say, no, that was a small problem. No, the manager just made a small problem. Tomorrow, small problem. The next day, small problem. Until the manager is a giant that no one can manage, or the chairman. So this is the awareness and sens sensitivity. Security is that is the cooperative having physical and non-physical guards uh, placed ahead of time to protect against threats? Are we ready for the Ukraine war? 
Do we have, are we secure? What are the guards we have put in place? If, price, if the price of fuel rose to 20,000, are we going to walk to work? If the dollar, you know there is all this cryptocurrency, you've had cryptocurrency, digital money. The other day I had the, the UK government talking about the central government actually controlling digital money. Do you understand digital money? I understand very little. I will not even pretend. So if, if money moves digital, are we going to be part of this? Or we shall be left out? So physical guards, security, robustness is to withstand and resist change. And it involves proactive engagement of adverse events before they happen. What are the things we did proactively? When we heard there was COVID, I'm sure we thought it was a Chinese what? A Chinese <coughs> disease. I remember Trump kept saying the China, China disease. So robustness means that we should always be ready to withstand and resist change. Agility denotes, denotes the capacity and increased velocity that cooperatives can react and adapt to unforeseen erratic changes. This is what I was talking about. The Ukraine war started. Are we, are we actually agile? What is gonna to happen to us? Visibility is the ability for the cooperative members and committees to see the business environment broadly. Then flexibility. I can tell you guys, cooperatives are very unflexible in Uganda. Not because they're not supposed to be flexible. Everything is done in the traditional way. You go to a place, uh -uh. for us, we have one AGM like this, but we said there must be one meeting for members. Can you imagine a business which means meets once a year? Just think about it. If it was your business and your meeting once a year, what would happen? But that is the level of inflexibility some of our cooperatives have. Adap adaptability, defined as a cooperative's capacity to tolerate disruptions by making a deliberate plan to adjust to conditions. We must be revising our strategies, our business plans. That is adaptability. Redundancy is availab availability of extra resources. If there was a, this Ukraine crisis came, do we, are we redundant? Do we have redundant resources, by the way? Some of us, we are always counting the 30 days in a month. On the 15th day, we are already making phone calls. Mpola, yo, help me. We don't have what? Redundant resources. Even our cooperatives, when COVID came, they started calling banks, Mpola, yo, and the bank was like, no, I'm not giving you money. Why? Because of risks and vulnerabilities. And finally, on these three is um, ICT. Our cooperatives moving to the uh, digital world. Are we doing research? And not just this kind of research, but operational research. Do we know what's in the market? Uh, we are selling honey. Do we know what's happening in the honey value chain? Do we know what's happening in the digital world? Do we know what's happening with policy? So ICT becomes very important as a measure resilience, risk management, insurance. Government has invested through the agro consortium. How many cooperatives actually have bought into this insurance? People are still saying, oh, the, me, I, we wait for rain. So then rain doesn't come and you're at a loss. Finally, under the indicators is sustainability. And in sustainability, we are looking at maximizing the, 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 the use of our resources so that we don't deplete. I think at this stage, I'd like to invite James to take over, to take us through the analytical framework. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is James Kenga, and I was privileged to work uh, together with Jen and her team uh, in this research. So I think uh, at this moment, what will be most useful is um, if, if we can have the index projected uh, so that I just walk through uh, the team, because I understand we, uh, we sort of uh, limited in terms of time. So Joshua, I don't know if you can project the uh, measurement index. 
from the Excel form that I had shared earlier. Okay, okay, no worries. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted you all to you know, start seeing the index, uh, what it looks like in its uh, most raw form uh, before uh, the Huru Institute finalizes incorporating it into uh, the core profiler software. But overall, um, and you'll see it once it's projected, it's, uh, we have a series of variables that uh, will be useful for cooperatives to consider as they get to uh, measure themselves or rather get to measure uh, the resilience of their, uh, of their cooperatives. And we have, we start from three broad categories, which includes the traditional values, the ethical values, and, um, and principles. And in terms of how we uh, approached, you know, the process of um, developing this index, is first we assigned a weight to each of these three broad categories. And um, overall what we wanted to present is we wanted a scale, you know, cooperatives to have a scale that they can use uh, to measure themselves against these three broad um, uh, 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 variables that are useful in, uh, in measuring their resilience. So what we did therefore is, uh, yes, there it is. Um, so what we did therefore is, uh, you could see the first column, uh, column B, where we have uh, the cooperative principles, which we call the latent variables, because with these, we cannot uh, directly measure them. We have to depend on other uh, variables, uh, the observable variables, for us to adequately get to, uh, to measure the latent variables. So within the first column, it's what we call uh, the latent variables, and here it's where we have the three broad categories. So these are the cooperative principles, the traditional values, and um, uh, the ethical values. And um, we went through what we call a weighting process so that we assign proportions according to how important these three categories are, or rather, or rather how, how much they contribute to the resilience of, uh, of a cooperative. And the process included, you know, of course, the findings from the research that we had, and we also had key discussions with uh, some of you who are present here uh, today at this launch, just to understand um, uh, you know, how much people or how much cooperatives do value these three broad categories. And eventually uh, what we came up with was that um, the traditional values, which has um, seven uh, components within itself, contributes 50% to the entire uh, resilience of a cooperative. And then the ethical values, which has uh, four key components, uh, contributes 20% to the entire um, uh, resilience of a cooperative. And then finally, uh, the principles of cooperatives contribute the remaining 30% uh, to the resilience of, um, of a cooperative. And as you can see here within, uh, within the first column, the, the second column, column B, um, we start by first uh, discussing or rather showing the cooperative principles, which um, are seven, uh, the open and voluntary membership, 
member democratic control, member economic participation, autonomy and independence, training, education and information, cooperation among cooperatives, and finally the concern for, uh, for community. So we had to go through a second waiting process, which helped us determine across each of these broad categories what is the contribution of their specific components. So for instance, if you're talking of open and voluntary membership under uh, the cooperative principles, what proportion does it contribute to the entire resilience of, um, uh, of the cooperative? And again, the same process was used. Look, looking at the findings that, uh, that came out of the research, we you know, again uh, spoke to some key informants um, uh, within the cooperative sector to understand you know, rather than, other than you know, the broad value uh, of the three categories, how do they also value, you know, what, what proportions do they feel these specific components contribute to, um, uh, to the entire resilience of, um, uh, of a cooperative. Then column D is what we have, uh, or rather what we call the observable uh, variables. And now uh, these are what cooperatives will be using to measure themselves. And um, how we came up with this, again, we went back to you know, the statu uh, statutory policies um, uh, within, the, uh, within the country uh, to basically identify what applies to each of, um, uh, of these three uh, broad categories uh, that we have. And um, from that then, the, the main question that we asked ourselves was how do we directly measure each of the components of these latent variables. So again, we looked at the standard and statutory practices uh, that can be used to measure these, um, uh, these variables. And uh, also, you know, from the consultations uh, within, uh, with, with some of the uh, experts within um, uh, the sector, they got, you know, we got to come up with a list that cooperatives can use. And this is what you're seeing within column, uh, column D. Uh, to get to finally uh, measure themselves against each of these components of um, um, uh, the variables that contribute to uh, the resilience of a cooperative. And then what we have on column E is what we call a measurement question. So this is the question that uh, cooperatives will be asking themselves as they interact with, um, uh, with this index. So for instance, um, if you look at column E, the, uh, uh, the third row, I guess, yeah. The question says, do you meet this parameter? So for cooperative, what they'll have to do is they'll have to look at this row by row. Um, column D, of course, goes in tandem with uh, column E onwards. So for instance, as a cooperative, I'll be looking at um, uh, the observable variable which says cooperative was formed to do business and not to receive uh, donations. And the first question I'll ask myself as a cooperative is whether I meet this parameter. And you? As a cooperative, what you have to do is simply just give a yes or no. A yes, meaning you meet this parameter, and a no, meaning you do not, um, uh, do not meet um, uh, this parameter. And then we go ahead to give an opportunity for cooperatives you know, to include more context in terms of how they are measuring themselves against each um, uh, of these observable variables. So. Um, this, this includes, you know, we will be looking for comments around, uh, you know, for, for us to, you know, to better understand the measurement given. For instance, if a cooperative says no, they do not uh, meet uh, a certain parameter, you know, we'll be looking, you know, towards them telling us, you know, a little bit more, what are some of the reasons that um, uh, they feel hold them back from, um, uh, uh, from meeting that specific parameter. And we'll be using some of this information also to come uh, to come up with uh, the final recommendations that we'll be giving uh, to the cooperative, depending um, on the final score um, of, of, of the resilience. And then next, what we have is uh, on column H, is what we, uh, we've titled the weightings, uh, the weightings ranking. And we have three, three categories here. We have the very critical category, we have the critical category, and we have um, uh, the moderately critical category. So the importance behind um, uh, 
behind this column was we, we identified that across the different parameters that we are using to measure um, um, uh, the different uh, uh, observable variables, we felt that there are some which deserve to be weighted more compared to others. And the most important here being the very critical um, um, variables, which mainly touch on statutory provisions. Um, uh, for instance, here an example that I can give includes you know, annual audits conducted and uh, reports have, have to be shared at least two weeks before cooperatives uh, conduct their, uh, their AGMs. So these are very critical uh, variables that we felt should definitely be weighted more compared to the critical and, um, and the moderately critical variables. So the very critical here occupy um, uh, a weighting of three, the critical occupy a weighting of two, and then finally the moderately uh, critical uh, occupy a weighting of, um, uh, of one. And then moving on to the next column, um, uh, we call this the weights, the weights met column. And basically this is a calculation that is done according to the parameters that a cooperative meets and the weight given to that specific variable that, um, uh, that the cooperative has just measured themselves against. And then next on column J, we have the sum of weights met. And this is a total sum of, um, um, of um, uh, uh, weights met for each component of, uh, of the latent variables. And then next we have the maximum sum of weights, which is the total sum of weights according to the, uh, the weights that uh, were given to, uh, to each parameter. And then finally now we have a resilience score against each component across the three broad categories of, um, uh, of cooperative resilience. So if you also look closely, you'll see we have columns that are automatically filled and we have columns that um, uh, the cooperative will have to fill in by themselves. I think we have about two columns that the uh, cooperatives will have to fill in uh, for themselves because we, we wanted to, pre to provide a very simple tool but you know effective in terms of um, uh, measuring um, uh, the resilience of these, uh, of these different cooperatives. And lastly what then will happen is um, if, you, if you get to scroll uh, downwards towards the total score for the, uh, for the principal so for each, for, each, um, for each of the three broad categories, at the end, what a cooperative will get to see is the score that, they, uh, that, they, uh, that they've met. For instance, for this particular cooperative, they've, uh, they have a score of 18.38 out of uh, the 30% that the principals uh, contribute towards the resilience of a cooperative. And then if you scroll down, so once, once a cooperative is done ranking themselves against the, against the principles, they move to the traditional values. The same process um, um, is repeated. And then at the end, what, what again they get to see is the final score against, um, um, against the 50% that the traditional values uh, do contribute. So again, for this specific uh, cooperative, they had a score of 26.2 against the 50% that, um, uh, that the traditional values um, do contribute to the, uh, to the resilience of a cooperative. And then finally, they'll get to measure themselves against the ethical values. Again, it's the same process. And also they get to see how much they score uh, when it comes to the ethical values against the 20% that these values do contribute to the resilience of a cooperative. And then finally, um, if you scroll to, to my left, please. Yes, so now here we provide a scale. So with this scale here, um, it summarizes the total score scores of the cooperative against the three broad categories. So for instance, for the, uh, for the principles which contributes, uh, contribute 30% to, to the resilience of a cooperative, this specific cooperative scored an 18.38%. Uh, for the traditional values, they scored at 26% uh, against 50. And then finally for the ethical values, they scored at 10% against um, uh, 20%. And then the final score for this cooperative is 55%. We provided a scale here um, uh, of, you know, basically just to conclude what that particular number means to, um, 
to uh, to a cooperative, and it's it's ba it's based you know from you know from uh, a score of very low resilience, which is below 20 percent, to very resilient, which is between 81 and um, uh, and 100 percent. So this is basically the process that cooperatives will be using uh, to uh, to run through um, measuring themselves. Uh, measuring the, co the, the resilience of, um, uh, of their cooperatives. Again, this is not how, how it will appear in its final form. It, it won't be an Excel form for them to fill in, but rather it will be incorporated into uh, the core profiler system that uh, Uhuru uses. And now I'll invite uh, Samuel to briefly speak through um, that process. Good morning, everybody. My job is to talk about the core profiler system. And my intention is to keep it very, very simple. First of all, there is a little remote that was offered to Jen at the beginning. Can I have that, please? Because there's a presentation I'll be following. Now, wonderful. So this is the presentation. The remote allows me to co control it from here. But for us to make this decision, the data has to be accurate. How does the data become accurate? This is where the platform comes in. It effectively helps us collect the data. And the beauty about the way the platform is being implemented is that it can be used in any part of the world. For obvious reasons, we are currently testing it in Uganda. We would have difficulty testing it in other countries at the moment, but it's easier to test it in Uganda. And with that said, I just want to point out that after we have done that, we can then move on to the final bit about this presentation, which is just talk a little bit about the technology. The core profiler system is a web-based system, which means there is a website where you can go to access it, and that way you can access it from any country. There's also going to be a mobile-based component. The mobile-based component means some cooperatives are in very remote areas, so they really don't have an internet connection. But using a smartphone, you can access the system and basically work with it. So how will the system work, or how will you interact with the system? You saw all the screens that Mr. Kenga had just shown us, the Excel documents with lots of fields. With the system, it will all be compacted into the system so that you log in, you register an account as a cooperative. That is one step. I'm going to give a few other options. After you have registered the account, you will then be asked to fill in some information. Usually, account registration asks you for the name of the cooperative, the email address, a couple of those basic details. But after that, it will, you'll then fill in a bit of information. What information are we talking about? Things like, what business does your cooperative do? When was the last time you had an AGM? Who attended the AGM? These are all the details within the, the software. It is using the very same fields that Mr. Kanga just showcased. Most of this is supposed to keep your life simple. Remember, technology is your friend, not your enemy. In addition to that, once you have entered that, the system then computes your resilience index as the cooperative. And this is how we end up with this screen. My intention is to keep it very simple, not take a lot of time, and not get embarrassed constantly. But at the same time, let's talk about some of the questions that Mr. Kenga just showcased. I just want to summarize them very quickly about the cooperative. Thank you. Now, the first one is, all right. <laughs> the first one is, there are a few things that the software will allow you to do the analysis on. Some of these are questions like, it will showcase list of cooperatives per business type by location of the cooperative or even by the cooperative level. This is information that helps. It helps us analyze the performance of the cooperative, but also gives us regional data about which cooperatives are distributed in certain areas, what is it that they are specializing in. This is just to give you an idea of what the software allows you to do. Further analysis would allow you to extract things like the number of cooperatives per cooperative level, per location. All of this is helpful information just to make decisions. One thing that we want to emphasize is data-based, data-driven decision-making is very crucial to the sustainability of a cooperative. And then 
finally, the remaining bit would be list of fully paid up members per cooperative. Now, what I'm showing are just a few of the analytics that can be obtained using the software. It doesn't mean these are the only ones. There are lots more. At the same time, we keep on working with Uhuru to make sure we enhance it to give you a lot more value out of it. Like I said, technology at the end of the day should generally make your lives a lot easier. What's the way forward? I'm just going to quickly run through this one because this is my very last slide anyway. A lot of testing is still ongoing. Just like is the case with lots of systems, there's always a need to test them to make sure they work perfectly, they deliver the service on which they are supposed to be delivering. And in addition to that, there will also be a couple of other steps that will be undertaken. There's the longitudinal study. I hope I said that right, longitudinal study, scheduled for approximately 20 cooperatives. And underscoring all of this is, of course, the need for your support, your participation, and also to get feedback from you. It generally helps us make the system a lot more resilient, a lot more <laughs> effective, and generally offer the value that it is meant to offer to you. Having said that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I got embarrassed by this little piece of technology. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much indeed. Another round of applause. Okay, I believe we're making good progress and I think we're getting into one mind. We're beginning to understand these complex matters a little bit better. It's time to launch our report. We'll interrupt our program a little bit because our guest of honor is here, Honorable, the Honorable Minister of State for Cooperatives in the Minister of Trade and Industry and Cooperatives, Honorable Gume. Um, he will be launching our report but I'm not worthy to tie or even untie the laces of his shoes. I'll invite the chairman of the board of Uhuru, the Uhuru Institute, Mr. Dunstan Chisule, to come and invite our guest of honor to launch that report. Okay, thank you so much, Reverend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, without wasting much time, uh, Honorable Minister, please you're welcome to come and say a few words and then you will launch a report. Leonard, uh, kindly accompany the big man and then we'll stand here as guards as he's speaking and then we will accompany him to. Thank you. Uh, the chairperson and members of the board uh, of Uhuru Institute, uh, the researchers, I saw the registrar here, cooperators, I saw somebody from the National Planning Authority, uh, and all of you researchers and the management of Uhuru, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm extremely happy to be here, first of all, at the launch of a research that is going to help me in my office and my officers to equally analyze the resilience and be able to measure how predictable the cooperators, the cooperatives are, and the I could be in position to learn that while I'm in Kampala, Cooperative X can easily collapse in two years if we don't uh, put into action and into place so many other aspects. Today uh, is very important for the cooperative movement. I have listened to their districts used in analyzing the cooperatives. I've also discovered that uh, you have adequate research on the total number of cooperatives you have in the country. And uh, you have mentioned some issues which have interfaced as a minister of this sector for the past uh, five and a half years. I know it all 
And uh, however, I'll also take this opportunity to mention a few things that are pertinent to the development of the cooperative sector. One is that uh, the cooperators, I have seen the cooperators resign or give up their responsibilities to the management. It is touching to see a cooperative meeting once in a year and assigning its responsibilities to the board. But also, the board is also surrendering their responsibilities to the managers. And the managers now seem to be working with the whole cooperative in their briefcases. And this is very dangerous to the cooperative movement. Two, the board, the designers of the law were very careful. They put the board in place, they put the supervisory board in place, and uh, there is the general meeting. But what happens is that the supervisors are supposed to adequately monitor what the board is doing, because responsibility has been surrendered to the board members on behalf of the members of the cooperative. I want to give you a story, a brief one yesterday, but one I was in the West. There was an annual general meeting and the interests of the members of the board is always to be re-elected. And they don't bother about other things. But I was very impressed, and I want you to take a lot of care, that irrespective of the remoteness of the location of the cooperative, this is thing of UPE should not be underrated. The cooperators now can read, understand, and be able to give caution. In this cooperative, you have talked of the compensation of cooperative cooperatives to those who, cooperatives which lost money by government. In the office, if you sat, you would tell them, you would write to them, please indicate to us if you received the compensation money. And they'll write back to say, yes, we did. And they will give you a receipt. And for you, you would feel very contented. That's not accountability. If you went to the ground, you will find different things. So, particularly to this union where you visited, I found that the manager of the cooperative had lured I will call it lowering, had lowered the board members, especially the chairperson, treasurer, to be signatories on account. And uh, there was a dual collusion. The manager would take resources this end, and these are government resources sent to them as compensation. And the board chairman would also become a signatory in the bank. So when I went, they had the systematically told me that this meeting is for elections. Then the audit report will come later. But there was also a supervisory report. So I insisted that I needed to look at the report of the supervisory committee. They brought their report, and I was very, very amazed. They had analyzed the transactions of the board analyzed the role of the manager and recommended that this board and manager be suspended. And this is, I don't know whether you term it as resilience or otherwise. But for me, I think the cooperators and also the law put in place yardsticks to monitor the resilience of these cooperatives and you would be able if they were doing their work. So what happens? The board, the manager, 
the general manager resolves to suspend everybody. And that is it. So we put a caretaker manager. Now, you should also look at the issue of patronage. The societies, how are they patronizing to the union? In some incidents, you find a union and a board doing things detached from the primary societies. They do business without the input of the primary societies. They only call primary societies after the end of two years that you come for a meeting to vote. And this is also a problem in the cooperative sector. So the board was resolved, but this was as a result of the supervisory committee. Now, when I look at Uhuru and the whole cooperative sector, for me, I take Uhuru as a, an eye-opener. Some people think there is a conflict of interest. You cannot always be sending off somebody who is giving you a pointer that there's a problem here, you better come in here. This report, it would be silly for me to sit in my office and say, the priorities don't allow me to go and inaugurate this report. Because I'm going to use it. We should be partners. And then I would also like to inform you in my observations from your report that uh, the cooperators have strategic plans. They have work plans. But there's a problem. Once the work plan is approved, follow this one also, because now you are listening to the real cooperator on the ground. So you give them a work plan. You say, I want to have a look at your work plan. They will do that. They will give you the work plan. Now, there is an incident that happened a month ago. Kahneman discovered that we are losing some money. The government is losing some money for compensation. So the Kahneman designed a telephone number similar to a Kampala one, 041. Now, I want you to note, you cooperators here, they ring a manager and the chairman of the board that you have been invited to South Africa by the Minister of State for Cooperatives. And in three days, you should have brought, sent in two million shillings on this account to process your visas and the passports. In five minutes, a board chairperson with a manager of the cooperatives is sending in money to a con man. In five minutes, my question is, was this money in the work plan? Was it budgeted for? How did he send that money in five minutes. Did he refer to the work plan? Do you think in, in your survey, you found a budget of a cooperative that the chairperson of a cooperative union or society shall be going to South Africa outside the country and there's a provision? So that's also bad management. How does, I think there's also collusion. Management and then the chair of the board. As if that's not enough. The law also provides that these managers, I mean the chairperson of a board, must not be seeking to register accounts. Because if you are part of a, if you sign on the accounts, who will be supervising who? So in the other incident, they were part of a system. He was also embattled in a fraud. And he went with the manager. That's why you find so many conflicts between, within the cooperatives. And we cannot go far. How do we get these conflicts? And how do we predict that there will be a problem in this cooperative sector through this report? I want to congratulate you for what you've done. I would also like to comment and give a few other highlights on your analysis. The government really has tried to promote the cooperatives because we are aware 
that without the cooperative, the National Planning Authority will tell us, without people coming together, we cannot jump this level of poverty. We were smart, smartly moving until COVID came in. Then we went two steps behind. But now again, we will need again. The president, in his own wisdom, instructed me, and I've shared with you, that I should write a paper on how best we can co promote the cooperative movement in Uganda. That is emanating from a situation where he has discovered that the cooperative movement is very critical for the development of our country. By the way, the mere appointment of a minister of state for cooperatives is in itself a gesture that we are interested in promoting the cooperatives. I also have to say something about uh, the handouts, the parish development circles, Emioga. You know things have changed. In some, the cooperatives are for the people, by the people, to the people, they, are the, they must take their decisions. But as government was saying, that people must now have their mindset changed. We must bring them to reality. Come together and do some work. But when we give them a token, we are not saying we are killing the cooperative. We are saying this should do, act as a motivation for you to build on that. Other than the initial stages, because that was utopian, let's come together and let's do work. We are saying come together and we we'll assist you. We are not saying get collapsed. We assist you and you promote your vision. That is the whole issue. I'm afraid if I had a lot of time, I would have continued talking. But when I was coming here, I was passing through the, the documents in the entry. This is what I discovered. Something, some cooperative union from Acholi will expound on that. Lango or Acholi, I can't be specific. The politicians in that region had called the cooperators and invited me for a meeting that we want all the cooperators to come in this meeting, we want to see what they are doing, how, how they are operating. You know what these cooperators did? And uh, for me, inside me, I'm saying what next, but I'm happy. They have written to me and said we shall not attend that meeting. Because these cooperators, these politicians don't belong to this union. We shall not. If you are not a member, you have no business with our activities. And, uh, and uh, I was supposed to visit on 19th. I cannot go because they have said they are not part of that meeting. If the politicians want to become part of the unions, they should also join and be and patronize to the union. So. I have a difficult task of ringing the politicians that I'm afraid I will not come because this is a decision of the members. We are none members, even myself. The law, my commissioner will talk about it. We have tried to amend the law in order to harmonize the conflicting scenarios within the tier four microfinance support center and the rest. The government has also given a holiday to the circles for 10 years, you must also emphasize, I heard her mention, and I was excited, the cooperators don't make profits. What do they make? Surplus. Surplus. They don't make, and that, that is the distinction from the cooperatives with the businessmen. The businessmen are interested in profits. For us, we want surplus to cut out socioeconomic development for the region. We are anxious. I want you to, we're also making a report, a research. These banks, really, the interest, the money in this country is now very expensive. Very expensive. A farmer getting a loan from a bank at 30% per annum. That is a suicidal. So if people came together and then the cooperatives, the circles, the parish development model circles, you give any money. You lend somebody money at maybe 1% for that somebody to buy inputs for his agriculture, for agriculture purposes. 
then we will go far. Money will go to the less privileged. That is if we also put together our efforts to solve conflicts and fraud at that level. Somebody gets money, disappears with it, and then he finds his way through court and is at large. This kills the morale and the motivation. Ladies and gentlemen, I am privileged to be here, especially at this very important meeting. I'm looking forward to my colleague Leonard here. Come to office. Let us, let us discuss this report in detail. Let me also be informed. Maybe I'm also a little bit analog. Let me be informed. And I get to know what is happening. I press a button, and I know what is happening in Katakui. Then my officers can be able to really salvage the situations. I want to thank you so much. And at this point, I would like uh -huh. where? Yes. Sign. Yes. Here. Yes. And then after signing, I launch. No, you're not signing. Okay. You don't qualify. If you want to qualify, just see. Go and tell these people. Vote me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And you are there. Come and join me this side. <laughs> no, join me in the. Where is that? Lango. Uh, Amrata. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> State minister. Yeah. Cooperatives, huh? Fifteen. Can I put it here? Yeah. Yeah. I would now like to take this opportunity to officially launch the cooperative identity as a crucial determinant of cooperative resilience, a case study of cooperatives in Uganda. Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed, Honorable Minister. We understand your schedule is quite heavy, but like you said, you took time off because you realized that this was a critically important thing to be an important dashboard for the cooperators around the country, 10,000 parishes and other cooperatives in different segments. Thank you very much indeed. As the Minister has escorted out, he's launched the report, it's now official. We move into our next session, which is going to be coordinated by my colleague, Doris. Uh, as we launch into that, we're going to have a wrap-up of the earlier segment. Uh, Jane Amuge Okello, who was the principal investigator, will come and wrap up the uh, observations from her colleagues in uh, between seven and ten minutes, and then we'll go into the panel discussion, which is probably going to be one of the more exciting segments. Jane Amuge Okello, Operations Director, welcome. Thank you once again. I hope you're not getting tired of my face. Um, Joshua, could you please uh, take us to the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index before I, I discuss the findings of the research beyond the framework that you've developed? 
Um, my colleague took you through the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index. I just wanted to give a little more detail on the, not that, the one before. Yeah. So in our analysis, when we're framing the index, we apportioned the importance of each of these um, latent variables such that as a cooperative or as a stakeholder, as government, when you're out there, you know what variables to pay a little more attention to so that we can achieve resilience. Under the traditional values, we agreed that from the research findings and our own subjective judgment, that the values of self-responsibility way overall on the entire resilience of the cooperative weighs 10%. Self-help uh, self also weighs 10%. And then the other that would be very important is solidarity. I think you heard the minister talk about people fighting. And um, that, uh, so solidarity also got 9%, which is very key. And then another value that was highly ranked is, is uh, social responsibility weighing, I think there is, sorry, there, there, is, there is a mishap here. Honesty weighs 7% and social responsibility 6%. So in the real sense, and democracy 8 if you went out to a cooperative and you looked at the resilience measurement index and you saw that the indicators for self-responsibility are very low, you would have every reason as government, as a regulator, as a supervisor to support that cooperative such that they can improve on elements of self-responsibility. On the side of the principles, the principle of training education and information was very highly ranked. A lot of the people do not know even what we are talking about right now in as far as identity is concerned. And so in our research, we saw that if members, if stakeholders, if governments, if everybody understood what the cooperatives are about, then the decisions would be made. So. Under the principles, you realize that everyone needs to pay attention to training. But how many cooperatives are training their members and their leaders? You imagine you're in a farming cooperative and your chairman stopped in P2. This is the chairman that you expect to go and negotiate with Stan Big Bank for a loan. Do you really think the chairman is going to understand the complexities of the ratios that is expected you know, to give? But with training, this person could get better. And then the other elements, therefore, that we are saying is once the resilience index is measured and we have the total scale, as James showed, then we'll start looking at certain elements of sustainability. And amongst them are things like caring for others, things like concern for community, which, which someone would be looking at. So quickly, I'll be taking us to the actual findings. We, I mean the findings from the focus group discussions that we had from the key informant interviews, just breaking it down in simple, simple language. So in terms of the way in which cooperatives are implementing or applying the cooperative variables, that self-responsibility, we noted that there is lack of a cooperative lifestyle. In the days, a child would be born in a cooperative family. You took your cotton to the cooperative, you got an invoice for tuition from the cooperative, so you actually grew up in a cooperative setting. But how many of us can relate with cooperatives that way today? And we are saying if government, if we development partners are actually working to get cooperatives to a better place, we need to invigorate a cooperative lifestyle. It cannot be something that is done once in a while. The other thing we found out is that there is a general lack of a shared vision. 
You find that people are in a cooperative, but others want to do um, coffee, others want to do alcohol, others want to do honey. So the shared vision is lacking. Also from the research, we, we noted that there is limited investment in jointly owned assets. Most cooperatives don't have assets. You find a cooperative has been around, except for the unions that have land and all these old stores. But the cooperatives today actually don't critically have any, any serious assets to talk about. Now that is a disincentive. People want to associate. If you see the levels of defense we are hearing from uh, the cooperative that the minister went to, it's because there's something to fight for. There's something that you know you want to defend in terms of assets. We also noted from the research there's a mismatch between members' needs and aspirations and the enterprises that have been chosen. You find that a cooperative is going to be asked to invest in red chili. You know the tiny paper? But you find that the cooperative members did not intend to do that, but because the donor said, you know, there is market for red chili, go and grow red chili. So there's a mismatch between the businesses they're doing and some of the enterprises chosen. We also noted from this research that there is hands-off and eyes-closed relationship between members and leaders. Hands-off, eyes-closed. Now you can imagine what's happening to these cooperatives. Uh, for self-help, members are not resourcing their cooperatives. You cannot milk a cow that you're not feeding. But the members are demanding from the cooperative, but they're not investing in the cooperative. As far as solidarity is concerned, we notice that there is a, a divergence between those who want pure economic gains and then those who like you know, to socialize and feel at home. Cooperatives are supposed to be a family. But there are others who will say, you know, this year we didn't make money, we cannot dance. Why? For them, their mind is what? Is money. It's not about community and association. We also took note that ethnicity is not enough to keep a cooperative collaborative and strong. You hear names like Banyankole Kwetarana, Lao Cooperative Union, Busoga Growers. There is no guarantee that because you're baptized Busoga Growers, you're going to be what? You're going to be united with a common bond. But people have this misconception that when you form a cooperative called Banyankole Kwetarana, there is unity. I think you can see the stories are different. And also we noted uh, with interest that cooperatives that have infused art, music, and edutainment are actually attracting young people to their cooperatives. And today I'm happy actually to see Naguru, Naguru Cooperative, Community Cooperative, mainly um, where there are young people. We saw that as a very interesting case study that the young people were coming in because young people love to play. They like to do things that, you know, would keep their hearts beating. We also noted that uh, the essence of the similarity in business type and the location of the businesses was very, very, very key. That if you're going to, if you're going to have um, your business, your, you must, your members at least should be in a similar business. Let me give an example. If you're a cooperative that is in Sogam, but some of your members, their main product is coffee, do you really think you're going to bulk enough sorghum? But we find those, mismatch, those mismatches where members are doing different things and yet they belong to a cooperative producing one thing. But also that location makes it easier and affordable for the cooperative to run. But if you have members scattered, they will tell you there is no transport for coming to train or there is no transport for, for coming to the meeting. So that is one, one other thing we noted. In solidarity, there is security and autonomy. We saw that cooperatives that have solidarity are able to defend themselves. We got a, met a cooperative in Mbale which said they had got a contract to export. And when the person who connected them got the coffee the other side, he changed the story. But because this cooperative had the resolve, they fought their way until the money was paid. That is solidarity. And it's because they belonged to a union. Multiple membership is antagonizing cooperatives. People are in 10 cooperatives doing what? Why would you be in 10 cooperatives? Someone says, you see, I'm in this growers cooperative, I'm in circle X, I'm in circle Y. What are you doing in all those cooperatives? Do you think really we will be living uh, the definition of cooperatives? For democracy, founder member syndrome. Everybody was singing this founder member syndrome. The founders have refused to leave. 
the leadership. Do you know what the argument is? If we give these newcomers, they'll spoil it for us. So newcomers, do we have a bad reputation? Those of you that are joining the cooperative after. This is a serious thing, and I hope, um, I thought the commissioner is here, but it's something that actually really needs to be helped. The situation is bad. Founder members don't want to go. Democratic equality is at crossroads. People wonder, why must I be treated like the guy with one share? There is conversation that at least if I am the one patronizing the cooperative more, I should be given more privileges. So you see that the principles of cooperatives are being interrogated by the actual members of the cooperatives. Member owners or member controllers, we notice that the members are not in control. It is the managers, it is the chairpersons, the members are like their own chains. Most of the cooperatives, they've lost control. People are emphasizing quorum instead of participation. You hear someone saying, you know, we met the quorum. Did the members participate? Did they vote? So we found a lot of cooperatives with that challenge. And uh, in terms of uh, some of this, we observed that where the principle of democracy was being adhered to, there were less risks because the members were making decisions. Equality, there was, we noticed that the, the, the personalities cannot differentiate between them as the person and the offices they occupy. Someone takes all his bad manners to the cooperative. And so people need to start differentiating that I am Jen, but there is an office called operations director. That is not happening in the cooperatives. That someone carries himself and is everything in the cooperative. Then there's overconfidence and hubris. We have leaders who are making very risky decisions on behalf of the cooperatives. Opening branches, I think this is very common we found in Western Uganda, where many cooperatives are opening circles, opening branches. They are not able to, to match the asset and the liability side of the equation. So this is something, but also we notice a lot of the leaders in cooperatives have very high ego very egoistic, the decisions really around them, everybody singing, chairman, manager. Okay, one minute. Um, age, religion, gender were very key, and patriarchy. We saw some of the men not wanting the ladies to participate. Um, I think I want to just go to the recommendations and a bit on autonomy so that you, you can close. On autonomy, we realize that the, the regulatory and the legal framework is still controlling. That government comes in more as a control instead of as a supervisor and a regulator. So cooperatives want a better, a better relationship between themselves and government. The other thing that was key under autonomy and independence was the issue of um, arbitration. That arbitration, the way it is being conducted in, in, in Uganda is actually not delivering cooperatives. Why? Because people first don't understand arbitration, and then you realize that there is no clear process on who actually arbitrates for the cooperative. So there are so many cases that have not been attended to. And uh, government, yes, is doing whatever it can, but there is also overlaps between uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, NADS, you know, people complained a lot. Sometimes there's OWC, then tomorrow you see who, who exactly is supposed to do what, and this came from the farmers. And uh, disaster management was also very key, that there is this misconception that disaster is government's role. But we realize from this research that government is saying when a disaster occurs, the community should be the first to respond. But is the community with the capacity to respond to these disasters. So there are a lot of voices saying, can government take a more central role on disaster management, give us peace and security, and also ensure that the regulations that come do not affect a lot on training, information and education, everybody wants this to happen, that government and the cooperatives should invest heavily on training, information, and education. Um, I'll just run quickly to the last bit on cooperation and uh, cooperation amongst cooperatives, and I think this came out from some of the unions, that affiliation is financially draining. The primary cooperatives are saying to belong to the union, where is the value? You're asking for money, but you're not giving us back. There's also mission drift. Some of them complain that once they're in the union, the union dictates 
for them what they are supposed to do. And yet they are autonomous institutions. And a number of cooperatives worry that unions uh, 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 attract political interference. So they are better off being primary cooperatives and not affiliating to any of these unions. And uh, that was very interesting, a finding. Now, apparently from, from the research that we've done, we noted that cooperatives that were affiliated to unions actually had more risks and vulnerabilities compared to those that were not. Uh, in conclusion, the most conspicuous of our findings is the centrality of the individual and collective capacity, I mean personality, character, and the morals of the owners and the leaders of the cooperative. That is, emphasis on the moral and ethical values of the membership without the principles, um, with, without the principles is, would re actually really be in a vacuum. You cannot practice the principles of cooperatives without prioritizing the value, the behavior, the character of the owners of these cooperatives. The study notes of the interlocking nature of all the values and principles, and we advance that the consequence of their adherence can only be achieved as a whole. You cannot adhere to one value and ignore the other because it is seen as a whole. Cooperatives are formed for pragmatic economic self-development and fettered by political and philanthropic religious or social cultural influences. When you're forming your cooperative, you don't form with the mind of where is government in this. You form for yourselves. And so that is very important. And then the COP movement is faced with challenges in development paradigms and will require adapting to new ways of creating operational efficiency, ensuring solidarity within the membership and cohesion. Also important is sufficient information as well as deliberate educational programs. The governance structures that ensure patronage and remains inclusive and also operating system that enable competitive advantages, harmonious, symbiotic, and equ equitable relationships of its members. This study also infers that resilience on its own is insufficient. Rather, cooperatives must seek to achieve sustainable resilience for which it is, it, its, very, its very identity is embodied in people-centeredness. Conclusion, whether or not cooperatives observe the values and the principles, they will still be exposed to risk. At all levels, whether you're adhering or not, there's still an exposure to risk. And therefore, because of the dynamic network of the internal and external stakeholders, while the risk levels may vary depending on their degree of adherence to the values and principles, the distinction is that cooperatives that uphold the statement on the cooperative identity have been found to be better prepared, more responsive, and adaptive to disruption. Sadly, our study revealed that a majority of cooperatives in Uganda are not applying the statement of cooperative identity the way that they should. And a lot of it was because of not having information. Recommendations. Cooperatives must take full responsibility of their businesses by recognizing and applying all the values and principles of cooperatives. They should plan and devote themselves to serving their members, members first, in order to enhance long-term investment value. Additionally, cooperatives are social businesses. They must pay attention to the triple bottoms, the business, the social, and the environmental goals for which the cooperatives are set. To the government of Uganda, government of Uganda must appreciate that cooperatives are private businesses that should have the liberty to operate competitively and without avoidable constraints within its environment, like the laws, some of the laws that are in are constraining. Government also should undertake capital intensive investments like irrigation, energy, transport, telecommunication, security, standardization, extension services to promote a supportive environment rather than being seemingly a controlling authority. Uh, Public-private partnerships and matching grants are better structures for investment. Areas for future research. Although we have validated the study findings and pretested the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index, we recommend a wider testing and adoption of the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index by the government of Uganda as a monitoring and supervisory tool to provide evidence on how cooperatives can be championed as engines 
for agro-industrialization and inclusive socioeconomic development. To the International Cooperative Alliance, we recommend them to undertake a study on which values and norms can be adopted from the new generational cooperatives. There are cooperatives calling themselves new generational cooperatives that have taken care of some of these changes. This could be in line with the cooperative values and principles and how they treat capital. With those very many words, I would like to thank you. We've come to the end of our presentation. I hope our research made sense to you. Many thanks, Jen, for concluding the report, the research report. And thanks to all the previous speakers that have taken us through a wonderful ride this far. Before we can get into the next segment of this event, which will be our panel discussion with a number of speakers that have already been lined up in front of you, I would like us to hear some remarks from a representative of our, one of our funding partners without whom this, this research report wouldn't have happened. So we are extremely grateful to our funding partners from Open Society Foundation London. And, and the person going to speak to us is Michael Nkonu. Michael is on, on the Zoom link. And I would ask the technical team to help me um, have Michael on. Michael Nkonu from Open Society Foundation London. You're welcome to give your welcoming remarks. Well, thank you, Doris, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you, Doris, and uh, thanks to uh, the team at uh, the Uhuru Institute. Um, I first have to apologize that we've not been able to join you in Kampala, a city I love very much, and I would have loved to uh, be there to uh, um, join you in these discussions uh, physically, but it wasn't possible. So our sincere apologies uh, for that. Um, my name is Michael Nkonu. I serve as a program lead on food systems and agriculture at the Open Society Foundation in uh, based in London, uh, in the UK. And as you may be aware, we've been working with the Uhuru Institute uh, to try to support the um, resilience uh, capacity of cooperatives in Uganda, and by extension, hopefully, uh, we extend that across Africa as well. Um, our main goal of, or our main interest in this process is to say that for smallholder farmers, and also indeed for many other farmers who may not necessarily be smallholders, the voices of smallholders and the capacity of African agricultural systems to be able to influence um, uh, the market as well as to bring uh, a reasonable and sustainable impact to, to those involved will depend on the ability to coalesce the efforts and the capacity and power of, of individuals into one force to be able to influence the market, but at the same time to be able to influence policies, decisions that are important uh, for the continuous growth of the agricultural sector. Now, in, in that respect, we cannot do that if cooperatives are not sustainable in the long run. And so to be able to uh, be sustainable and influence policy decisions as well as market, uh, the market, it is critical that uh, we build cooperatives and institutions, farmer organizations or producer organizations, as some may call it, uh, to be resilient, strong enough, to be able to make the changes and the long-term changes that are needed, uh, to be able to bring the impact that is needed to be able to improve livelihoods and to lift people out of poverty. Now, the important thing about the index that you've been talking about, and as you may have, you may see in the discussions when you go into the next phase of the meeting, is that you do have different components of the index. And the reason being that economic rule or economic benefits are not the only reason why cooperatives should exist. And they are not also the reason why cooperatives should come together. 
There are many other things that are affecting cooperatives now. We have political situations affecting cooperatives, uh, particularly when you have a government in some countries that governments are not conducive or do not actually find cooperatives uh, useful. And so they disband this cooperative or they do not provide the adequate support for them to be able to organize themselves. Number two, climate change is becoming a major issue uh, in agriculture and not just in agriculture, but in our li daily lives. And this means that we need to have systems and strategies that confront or uh, reduce the risk and impact of climate change on agricultural production. And, and, and to an extension, to the livelihood and income of farmers. And so if a cooperative is not planning effectively, if a cooperative is not encouraging and then mainstreaming the climate risk is the its strategy and planning, then that cooperative is likely to fail. So for example, if a cooperative is not looking at seeds that can withstand uh, short rains or seeds that can uh, bring a uh, high yield at a, at, a, at a very short period for each farmers, and there's a major drought, then those farmers are going to struggle and the economic benefit is not going to be uh, there for those farmers to, to see. And so cooperatives need to be much more holistic in nature. They need to be looking at risk at different levels, from governance risk to management risk to economic risk, and to uh, climate risks, and also more, more importantly to the uh, institutional risks that, that afflict company, uh, cooperatives that uh, reduce their lifespan in most cases. So our interest is to see how we can give voices to farmers. And of course, we found a, a worthy co uh, partnership in Uhuru Institute uh, to be able to carry out the research and to come to this end and to be able to develop an index. The idea is to begin to think futuristic, is to be able to look at the data and the developments that are happening at each stage to be able to predict what will happen. And for that reason, to be able to identify solutions and measures that can be taken by cooperatives and their leadership to be able to affect uh, um, any major mishap that may take place uh, in the future. So for us, the index is a, is a critical tool. It's a tool that we hope that the cooperatives will take into consideration and will consider effectively in their management uh, of the institutions. And I heard the minister uh, talking about uh, uh, the work, uh, how they are interested in this work and inviting Leona to come and also help them to understand one. And I think that that's the space we actually want to go. The space where the, this tool is not just a tool that is being promoted by Uhuru Institute to cooperatives, but it's also a tool that is informing government policy and how cooperative policy decision makings are taken within Uganda and hopefully in future extend this across uh, many other African countries. So Uganda is a real starting point for us. Uh, it will be a shiny example if we are successful in terms of implementing the tool, piloting it effectively, generating the data, and be able to give the signal to cooperatives to be, begin to understand what issues, uh, where the risk is, and how they can uh, how can ch they can change situations uh, or their work plans and their strategies to be able to be sustainable and profitable uh, in the long run. So we would like to take this opportunity to say thank you all for the opportunity uh, uh, to be part of this work. Uh, we would really thank uh, Jane and Leonard and the team at Uhuru Institute for being diligent and working with us, uh, working with us uh, in terms of refining the strategy, working across it, and for they going to the field, working across it, and implement it with the Busara Institute as well. And we hope that uh, we will continue to be available to support you uh, to be able to dig further, uh, implement this over some time, uh, collect the data, and develop a system that gives early warning uh, to cooperatives in terms of what is important uh, for their sustainable development as well as their profitable development. We will be with you. We will continue to support you. And our hope is that we'll be able to influence policy, national policy, uh, 
a cooperative policy in Uganda, but more importantly, that will begin to be able to spread uh, this to, to across Africa and ensure that cooperatives can be sustainable uh, in the long run. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be with you and also remain uh, on the platform for, for this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. A round of applause for Michael from Open Society Foundation. We need to think uh, about the future. We need to think about mitigating risk. And uh, the Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index is one of the critical tools that is going to take us there. Okay, we are going into the panel discussion. Thank you again for those that are tuned in live on NTV. Thank you for sticking with us. And those on Zoom, you are part of us. And uh, we're going to go through this session. Um, for the panel discussion, we are going to have, in addition to the researchers that you've heard here today, we're going to have Andrew Sully from National Planning Authority. He's the senior planner, strategic planning at National Planning Authority. We're going to have the Assistant Commissioner for Cooperative Development at the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, uh, Mr. Robert Mpachivi. And we're also going to have the Director of Legislation at International Cooperative Alliance, Mr. Santosh Kumar. Mr. Santosh Kumar is going to uh, join us on Zoom, and I would like him to start and give us um, his remarks about cooperative resilience and our session today, his thoughts. Santosh, can you hear us? Um, sorry, just before you come in, we have four minutes, um, four minutes for each speaker. Kindly uh, keep, keep within the time. We are running bad on time, but four minutes for each speaker. Santosh, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Thank you, yes. Kindly go ahead. Thank you very much, and Jebale uh, Ko, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, really a privilege and an honor for me to represent uh, the Director General, Mr. Bruno Rollins, uh, of the International Cooperative Alliance, um, on whose behalf I'd like to extend uh, heartiest congratulations and highest appreciation uh, for the work uh, of the people uh, behind the report on uh, Cooperative Resilience Measurement Index and the research. Uh, it's truly um, uh, valuable, and uh, uh, it's going to really change the game, as, as, uh, as it said. Um, uh, frankly, I haven't had the time to go through the report in detail, the draft that was sent to us earlier. My apologies for that, but um, Prima Facie, it looks uh, phenomenal, I think. Uh, and again, uh, on behalf of the Director General of the ICA, our, our heartiest uh, congratulations. Um, uh, just to inform you about our organization, the International Cooperative Alliance uh, was established in 1895 uh, with, uh, among others, uh, uh, the mission to defend the international, international statement on the cooperative identity, which was reformulated uh, in 1995 and since 2002 uh, finds itself in the realms of international law. Um, uh, with, the, with the adoption of the ILO Recommendation 193 or the promotion of cooperatives recommendation. Um, we also uh, have a committee on cooperative law, which has been working in the recent past with the ICA Africa office uh, and the Pan-African Parliament to propose a, uh, an indicative uh, model law uh, which could help uh, cooperatives in Africa in the 21st century to, for their development. Uh, at the moment, the ICA is, uh, has constituted a cooperative identity advisory group to, uh, with the mission, with the aspiration to deepen the application and implementation of the cooperative identity. And I was all years when uh, the recommendations were made and uh, I've noted down the recommendation and the specific call made to the ICA. Secondly, um, uh, if uh, please allow me to state that I think it is the cooperative temperament uh, that allows the cooperative movement and enterprises uh, to remain resilient or at least strive for resilience, uh, despite the numerous challenges that cooperative movements around the world have faced in, their last, uh, in the last two centuries. A testament of this is the recognition by the United Nations uh, Education and Scientific Organization, or UNESCO, uh, which in 2016 uh, had listed the idea and practice of organizing shared interest into cooperatives as intangible cultural heritage of humanity meaning a cooperative in a small village in uh, any country 
or a big cooperative group in, again, any country, uh, are part of an intangible cultural heritage of humanity which needs to be safeguarded. So in this context, the work that the researchers, the partners, um, and the leaders uh, uh, at the Uhuru Institute and in Uganda that, that you've done uh, is, is remarkable and, again, um, uh, extremely valuable. Uh, uh, in terms of resilience, the last uh, um, such discussion, I mean, of course, we, have, we, have faced, we are facing the pandemic and we've seen um, how cooperatives have stood up uh, and, and supported um, communities during the pandemic and continue to do so, uh, even at the international level. But uh, a, a discussion on resilience, a deeper discussion on resilience took place, uh, if I'm not wrong, right after the, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis in the United States. And one example that our Director General uh, gives often is uh, that of Mondragon Cooperative Corporation in the Basque country of Spain, where within 10 days of the collapse of the of uh, Lehman Brothers, um, the employees of Mondragon uh, Corporation and also the members who were, who were uh, of the cooperative uh, decided to cut their salaries in order to keep jobs. Uh, this is a temperament. It's an, it's an attitude, I believe, uh, that cooperators are continued to uh, get continued to train in. And in this context, the fifth principle of cooperatives, education, training, and, edu and information, which, as a matter of fact, has remained a principle or a guiding uh, light for cooperatives since the very beginning, since the very first rules of the consumer cooperative movement uh, of, the, of, the, of Rochdale fame. Um, uh, uh, it, this principle is central. And also in, in the context of resilience, uh, this principle, the explanatory note to this principle talks about informing young people and opinion leaders about the benefits of cooperation. Therefore, um, my one cent uh, in, in, for this discussion is that we must not lose focus from education, training, and information for members, for staff, for uh, members of the general public as well. Uh, second point I'd like to quickly make is that it is uh, um, the cooperative identity uh, that is important to, to safeguard, but also the interplay of various aspects of cooperative identity uh, statement uh, that need to be considered in, in uh, ascertaining the factors that can make cooperatives resilience, resilient. The distinguishers of the cooperative business uh, model vis-a-vis -vis others um, uh, include uh, centrally democracy, uh, autonomy, equitable distribution of surplus, and concern for community. Um, and and uh, the concern for community principle, as all of you are aware, was added in 1995 and was the latest addition to the, to the, to the set of uh, international principles. Now, the explanatory note to the concern for community principles states that cooperatives work for the sustainable development of communities by policies approved by their members, which means democracy, uh, democratic practices are used to further the idea and the notion or the concept of sustainable development of communities. So the, the short point that I'm trying to make here is that the interplay of various aspects of the identity statement are extremely important to be considered. Um, again, uh, please allow me to thank you for this opportunity to join you, uh, albeit um, virtually, uh, but um, uh, Allow me to also congratulate you once again and uh, thank you for this invaluable work which, shall, which we shall go through in detail. And we look forward to having a collaboration with Uhuru Institute and uh, through our regional office uh, in Nairobi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Sorry, Sir, thank you, Santosh, um, for those remarks there. That was Santosh Kumar, uh, the Director of Legislation at International Cooperative Alliance. Next up, we're going to have uh, Mr. Robert Mpachibi. He's the Assistant Commissioner for Cooperative Development at the Ministry. Um, kindly come and share your remarks on the cooperative resilience and um, the report. Thank you. You're welcome. It's fine. You can. You can. It. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, Board, and the CEO, and other members for the opportunity uh, that you've given to me to 
also share my experiences. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, the Institute and all the stakeholders that have participated in this exercise. Uh, this is a landmark that we should all celebrate. Thank you so much. Congratulations, the Uhuru Institute. You've placed a, a good landmark to the movement. Uh, I was asked to go make a comment relating to regulation and development of cooperatives in view of resilience. Uh, cooperatives in Uganda are regulated by the following laws. The Cooperative Societies Act, uh, which was recently amended, and we have the Cooperative Societies Amendment Act. Uh, this is the act that gives the general uh, guidance and regulation of cooperatives. It's got lots of provisions relating to uh, leadership, operations, reporting, and uh, uh, governance generally about cooperatives. Uh, we also have uh, the tier four microfinance institutions and money lenders act enacted in 2016. Uh, before the coming in of the tier four, we used to have the Cooperative Societies Act. So the coming in of tier four brings on board two more regulators uh, of cooperatives, specifically the circles. And you, if you recall, my honorable minister did mention that we, we, have, we, we are making efforts to harmonize uh, the two laws. Uh, the tier four microfinance institutions act and uh, the Cooperative Societies Act are domiciled in different ministries. In the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Cooperatives, we are responsible for the Cooperative Societies Amendment Act, and the Ministry of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development is responsible for the Tier 4 Microfinance Institutions and Money Lenders Act of 2016. For those of you who are familiar with the two legislations, you would notice that there are areas of uh, say the evasion or conflict which we are working towards. The Honorable Minister asked me to make this comment on the same. So we are trying to do that. Uh, rest assured to the cooperators uh, that those areas will soon be sorted out and uh, we shall have a smooth flow within the movement. Uh, the Cooperative Societies Act establishes the office of the Registrar of Cooperative Societies and at the same time confers upon the same office bearer the functions of commissioner for cooperative development. In all this, uh, the bearer performs two main duties, which are the duties of the office of the registrar, uh, mainly it is regulation and development. To be specific, uh, under uh, regulation, and development, we do a number of issues, including policy, like I'm just talking about harmonizing the two legislations, the COP Amendment Act and the Tier 4. All this is intended to help societies or cooperatives to survive within the changing environment. So these are efforts we are making towards that. Uh, we also do the registration. I'm happy that the research has covered quite good statistics about the registration, but as the presenter did not, we do registration on a daily basis. The figure could have moved on a little bit from that, but uh, you are spot on. Since the research is not being reported as of today, it's not capturing information as of today. And many more are coming up. You've heard the Honorable Minister talking about uh, Emioga and the parish development uh, model circles. So we are still continuing with the registration. And uh, to the extreme, we deregister uh, these cooperatives that have failed to meet uh, the requirements. Oh, I didn't know four minutes in such short time. Uh, but that aside to support the development, we also do uh, maintain or manage the cooperative information system all data, it may not be uh, to the standards everyone would have expected, but I'm happy that uh, the coming out of this research is going to beef up on this. 
So the cooperative management information uh, system that we manage, we tend to be a, a one-stop center for all cooperative information. I'm really happy that the research covered the, t the whole tier uh, uh, of the cooperatives. Cooperatives are a four-tier movement, and the, the presenter did mention the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, and then also the apex. I'm happy that you got views from uh, all, all players in that tier. Uh, since, since this time is running very fast, I'm reminded of one minute. We are looking forward to making good use of this uh, uh, research and then the tool as well. Uh, as we did present about the tool, we shall continue having the same embarrassments until we stabilize. But uh, we are looking forward to making good use of this. Data is very important in all that we do. We, 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 we really appreciate all the stakeholders that have come in to work with us in the development and regulation of the cooperatives. I'm happy to inform you that the uh, government, in addition to what the Honor of Minister has presented to us, has liberalized the cooperative movement sector to the extent that many players have been attracted into this sector. If I'm to mention, I should not miss Uhuru Institute, the conveners of today. You have seen the contribution they are making to the cooperative movement. We are very proud of you. We have many ministries, departments, and agencies of government. Uh, my colleague from NPA is here. We are all talking cooperatives. We have the USAID, we have COICA, we have the cultural institutions in this country. They have all come up to support the development of these cooperatives. So in all this, we provide the partnership and the uh, linkages. <laughs>